Greetings folks, it's Professor Fiore. Today we are going to talk about Miller's Theorem, a very useful little device when we're looking at electronic circuits. Here's the deal. Let's say you have an amplifier that's inverting, and we see a lot of those, that has an impedance strapped from the input to the output. In other words, it's not referenced to ground. So how do we deal with this? Well, Miller's theorem allows us to turn that impedance into an input equivalent resistance or impedance and the same thing at the output. And it is a function of the gain. All right, you can see Z in Miller is basically equal to the feedback resistance divided by the gain plus one. And this is the absolute value of the gain. This is the gain magnitude. And at the output, it's equal to the feedback resistance times the product of A divided by A plus 1. In other words, for high gains, virtually the same as Z, right? A over A plus 1 is just about 1. So the Z out Miller will be pretty much equal to the Z in. And it will turn out that Z out Miller plus Z in Miller is always equal to the original Z value, right? This is Z times 1 over A plus 1. And this is Z times A over A plus 1. And if you add 1 over A plus 1 to A over A plus 1, you get A plus 1 over A plus 1, which is 1! Yay! Okay, now, how does this come about? It's easy enough to put the equation down, but where did it come from? Well, let's normalize the input and say the input is unity, right? 1 volt, if that makes you happy. What do we get at the output? Well, we get the gain times that, the inverting gain times the input of 1, would give us an output of negative A. So the voltage across this impedance would be from 1 to minus A, in other words, 1 minus a minus A, which is 1 plus A or A plus 1 if you prefer. Now because that's a much larger voltage than you have at the input, that creates a much larger current. In other words, if you think of this impedance over here, this would have this normalized input of unity and that input of unity divided by whatever this impedance is would give you the current. Well, back here, that voltage has been increased. It's no longer unity, it's A plus 1, which means the current is A plus 1. Well, if I scale that back to the original input of unity, that means the impedance looks like it's A plus 1 times smaller. So if I had 1,000 ohms out here and the gain was 10, it actually looks like 1,000 ohms divided by 11, right? 1,000 ohms by, divided by 11 is about 91 ohms. So that's what it would appear out here. Meanwhile, you'd have 10 over 10 plus 1, or 10 elevenths of that 1K at the Z out Miller position, okay? Now, knowing those two values, we can lump those in with other values that we have. For example, to find the input impedance of an amplifier, the Z out Miller might in fact affect the gain of an amplifier. So let's take a look at that in the real world. Take a look at a collector feedback bias. So here's a little common emitter transistor configuration. And notice we have, um, this is actually a combo bias because we still have some emitter resistance down here, but we have this RB value shunting back between collector and base. So how do we treat that if, for example, we want to find the input impedance, right? You can't just say, well, look, it's my uh, Z and base over here, beta times R prime E plus R E in parallel with 500K, because this 500K, although it starts at the base, does not go back to ground. It goes over to the collector, right? It goes over to the collector. So this has to get Millerized. And my goal here is basically to figure out what the Z in Miller is and see if we can calculate the Z in and determine on our sim if it all works out. In other words, if our predicted Z in based on Z in Miller is in fact correct. How are we going to do that? Because we can't use an ohmmeter. Remember, an ohmmeter is an active device. It sends out a little current. And if this circuit is powered, you can't use an ohmmeter. So we're going to use an effect, right? We're going to see the effect of the Zn, which if you've looked at the other labs, you know we can do that through a voltage divider effect. 
In any case, let's take a look at what we get for the DC bias. You know, we would expect this 20 volts to split out between RC, RB, and RE. The actual equation being RB divided by beta plus the RC plus the RE. That resistance quantity gets divided into the power supply minus the VBE. All right. We don't really know the exact value of, of beta. And I want to get an accurate result for my, my Miller calculation here. So I'm just going to go in and do a sim. You know, in lab, I'd say, well, for an 04, you know, with this kind of power supply and these resistors, uh, you know, it might be 150, 175, 200, something like that. Okay. But let's just go in and do the sim and see what we get. So we'll do a DC analysis, get a table of results over here and kind of go from there. All right. Okay. So um, let's take a look at our currents. Well, here's, you know, here's our uh, collector resistor. So that collector current, technically this is actually emitter current. And I'll explain that in a sec, is 1.34 milliamps. All right. How is this emitter current? Because it's going through the collector. Well, notice, right, emitter current is really base current plus collector current. The collector current's actually down here, going into node 7, going into the collector. The current through RB is the base current. So those two things are actually combining at this node and flowing through RC. So in fact, this is actually collector current. I know it's a fine point, but just so there's no confusion, that really is this 1.34. All right, now, your base current, that's the current going through RB, is showing up at approximately 9.17 microamps. So let's take those two currents and uh, figure out what the beta is. And then once we know what the beta is, right, and we know what the um, collector current is, right, we can find our prime E, we can find the gain. Gain's really important to find the Miller impedance, and then we can kind of go from there. Okay? All right. Now, to make life a little easier, I've done some of these calculations for us. Sneaky Pete. All right. So, IC over IB, um, 1.33. Like I said, it was 1.34 was IE. So you subtract off about, you know, 9 microamps, you get about 1.33. Divided by the 9.17 mics, you get a beta of 145. So as I said before, you know, that would be a pretty typical value you might see in, in a lab. Now, the uh, R prime E, standard equation, 26 millivolts over IE, we get 19.4 ohms. That's not going to be, you know, a huge impactor here because we have an unbypassed RE. In other words, we've got 1K worth of swamping. So the R prime E is not going to be super, super important. It's a small piece of the equation. All right. Now I am going to assume that Z out Miller equals the base biasing resistor. Remember your Z out Miller because here's your input, here's your output, is going to sit out here. It's actually going to wind up in parallel with RC and our load to set up your gain. So I don't want to ignore it. I don't know its exact value, though. I know it's going to be somewhat smaller than RB. If we have a decent size gain, it's going to be pretty close to RB, pretty close to 500K. So that's where I'm going to start. And, you know, if we wind up with a really low gain of like two or three, we can always go back and, you know, recompute this. But if we end up with a decently sized gain, you know, we'll just run with it. In any case, our RC for the gain, as usual, will be the biasing resistor, 10K, in parallel with the load, which is 200K. And now we add in the extra 500. This is actually Z out Miller. All right. We know it's a little bit less than this, but as it is, look, 500K is way bigger than the 10K. The 10K is going to be the dominant element in these three. You put them all in parallel, you get 9.35K, right? You know, if this was really 480K, it's still going to be pretty darn close to 9.35K. In any event, um, we can then come out and use our standard swapping gain equations, right? So the RC is 9.35K, RE, the unbypassed swapping resistor is 1K, the R prime we already found to be 19.4. And we get a gain of 9.17. So our initial assumption about Z and Miller and RB is pretty good. You know, we're only going to be off by, you know, 10% or so out here. So that's pretty good. All right. Inverting gain, of course. Now let's go find the Z in base. So standard equation, beta times RE plus R prime E. 
we know up here from the sim, the beta is 145. We've got the 1K for RE, the 19.4 we found for R prime, and that gives us just shy of 150K, 147.8K ohms. Okay, now the fun bit with Z and Miller. So take your 500K, the Z and Miller is going to be this value divided by A plus 1. Now, the A is the magnitude. Don't put in minus 9.17 because it's an inverting amplifier. We just think in terms of the magnitude of it. That was the computation. Remember the, remember the uh, calculation I did there. I said the input was 1, and then the output was A times the uh, input. In other words, it was a negative A times 1, so we get a negative A, and 1 minus a minus A gave us 1 plus A, A plus 1. So use the magnitude on this, 500K divided by 9.17 plus 1. That gives us just shy of 50K ohms, 49.2K. And our total ZN is the ZN base of nearly 150 in parallel with just about 50. Now, I kind of like this. I designed this circuit so that the ZN Miller was the smaller piece, so it had a bigger impact on the end result. You put those two things in parallel and you can see that it's really the Z and Miller that's the controlling factor. We get 36.9K, virtually 37K, All right? So that's what the prediction is. We get 37K ohms because of the Z and Miller on the RB over here, right? The Z and base is way bigger. It's like three times the value of the Z and Miller. So it's the Z and Miller that really plays a major role. And if we had a higher gain, that Z and Miller would be even smaller. All right, so how do we find in our simulation, or if we went in the lab, how would we find the actual Z in? Well, what we're going to do is a voltage divider between the Z in and the source impedance. So I can just throw in a different value here, right? The C in value, the X sub C for that is going to be small enough to ignore. It's going to be really tiny. So we just end up with a voltage divider. Now, just to make sure that everything's working, I'm gonna go in and do a um, little transient analysis here, just to verify that what we were talking about is in fact real. Do we get a gain of nine and so forth? So the VN is the green, right? We said this is 100 millivolts, okay? We can clearly see the inversion, the, the uh, maroon, plot is the V load that should be you know a, a little over nine times the size or about 0.9 volts and there you go you know there's one volt there's half a volt so we can see that's about nine tenths um, it seems fine all right so it seems to be working now here's what we're going to do theoretically the input impedance should be about 37k what I'm going to do is I'm going to take the source the source impedance and I'm going to turn this into 37k ohms what does that do for me? Well, it basically says this impedance and the Zn are the same size. So that's a one-to-one -one voltage divider. This 100 millivolts should split evenly between the source impedance of 37K and the Zn, assuming this calculation is correct. So this 100 millivolts should split. I should get 50 over here and 50 coming in. So the input base voltage on the transistor, if this is all correct, should be around 50 millivolts. Sound good, right? Like I said, can't use an ohmmeter. So let's go in, we can do an AC, um, an AC analysis here. See what we get. All right, so that's basically node seven. And there we are just a little bit over 50 millivolts. It's 50.7 millivolts, okay? Meaning half of this is on R1, half of it's on Zn. The only way that's gonna happen is if this impedance looking in here is the same as this impedance back there, right? So we can just do that little voltage divider effect and off we go. In lab, of course, you can just grab a resistor or a potentiometer or a decade box and just put it in series with your function generator and adjust it until this voltage right at the base falls to half of whatever you set for the input. When that happens, you know that the decade box or a potentiometer, whatever you're using, is the same value 
as the Zn, right? Simple matched impedance case. All right, so we can see that Miller's theorem is pretty useful, all right, um, for something like this little collector feedback. In particular, it's going to be useful when we do high frequency analysis. So look for some upcoming videos, right, later in the playlist that talk about high frequency analysis of maybe a junction FET, because these active devices, bipolars and field effects, have little parasitic capacitances associated with them. In other words, from, from terminal to terminal. One of them is in this Miller position, and we have to figure out what to do with it. All right? And again, it all comes back to this simple thing. You have an inverting amplifier with an impedance strapped across it, so this could be pure resistance. It could be a capacitance or an inductance or some complex Z. We can translate it into a Miller input equivalent and a Miller output equ equivalent, which are functions of gain. Right? Basically, it always reduces the value. The Z in Miller plus the Z out Miller will equal whatever the actual Z value is you started with. Okay? Beautiful. We'll see you next time.